maybe some other people will uh, be coming in in just a bit, but I uh, might as well go ahead and uh, begin to introduce our very, very illustrious speaker. And we're so, so happy and proud to have Timothy Heath with us here, a proud graduate of the College of William & Mary, class of 1994, in case you didn't know. And uh, we were just doing a tour of campus and reintroducing uh, Tim to all of the sites that he knew and loved, but they've changed a little bit in the last, uh, we hope, just a little bit for the better uh, uh, over the last couple of decades. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, our speaker today uh, and uh, his many accomplishments. I think you'll see that you have here uh, one of the top experts on U.S.-China relations uh, working today. He is a senior international defense research analyst at the RAND Corporation and member of the party RAND graduate school faculty. Prior to joining RAND in October 2014, he served as a senior analyst for uh, U.S. PACOM, Pacific Command, uh, the China Strategic Focus Group for five years. He worked for more than 16 years on the strategic, operational, and tactical levels of the U.S. military and government, specializing on China, Asia, and security topics. Uh, if you don't know much about RAND, the RAND Corporation is a research organization that develops solutions to public policy challenges to help make communities better throughout the world, uh, safer and more secure, healthier and more prosperous. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan, and public interest oriented organization. Tim uh, has published numerous articles and uh, a book as well. He is fluent in Mandarin Chinese, as some of us were learning earlier, and he has extensive experience analyzing China's national strategy, politics, ideology, and military, as well as Asian regional security developments. Uh, in addition to his BA from the College of William and Mary, he has an MA in Asian Studies from George Washington University, a BA in Philosophy from here, as I mentioned, and he's also now uh, doing some additional graduate work at George Mason University. Uh, and I want to say a few words about uh, the McSway and Walker Lecture, which is an annual lecture that is uh, endowed uh, thanks to the wonderful generosity of June McSwain, uh, an alumna of the college. Unfortunately, June can't be with us today. She's been uh, able to come to many of the last McSwain Walker Lectures. And she's a wonderful woman. And I just want to say that her vision uh, for this lecture is so appropriate and so topical. It is to create a lecture every year in which the intersections of culture and foreign policy, American uh, relations with the world, are uh, analyzed in depth. Because June's feeling has been that we've done far too little of that in our foreign policy analyst uh, world uh, in the United States. We've looked too much at the numbers, too much at force deployments, not enough at mindsets, not enough at culture and history. And so uh, I think it's a wonderful tradition uh, that Tim will be speaking in today. And uh, after the lecture is over, we uh, want to invite students who are in the room to join uh, with our speaker in a room upstairs. Please don't leave at the end of the lecture because it's an opportunity for a smaller group uh, really to, to pick Tim's brain and, uh, and learn more also about his work at RAND, um, his illustrious career in the US military. So I think that will be of great interest to people. Uh, without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Timothy Heath, who will speak, as you see, on U.S.-China relations, implications of China's pursuit of international leadership. Please join me in welcoming Tim. Uh, thank you again, Steve. Everyone can hear me on the mic? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, uh, really, really am thrilled to be here today. Um, in my career, and Steve mentioned some of the things I've worked on in my career, I've been able to brief very high level people in the US government, cabinet officials, four star level, uh, four star generals and admirals, uh, ministers of defense of, of many countries. And I have to say, those were all great experiences, but this is really special to come back to the school where I trained as a, as a young student um, and to be able to speak here with you today. I'm really, really honored and really appreciate uh, the sponsors of the McSwain Lecture Series, Reeve Center, um, and William & Mary. So, appreciate that. Thank you. So, I graduated here about uh, 20 years ago, as Steve mentioned, and it has been just an amazing uh, experience walking on this campus again and seeing how, just again, how beautiful it, it is. Um, and, and just to give you an anecdote of the, the way times have changed, I remember distinctly when I was a student in the early 90s, so I was here in 1990 and 1994, there's a new newfangled technology called the, the internet. Uh, and, and there's email. And this was a technology that's so new that most people didn't have it at their home. But if you went to school, like at William & Mary, four leaning schools like William & Mary, you could go and access and get an email account. And I remember thinking, wow, what an amazing convenience that I can communicate with almost anybody in the world by email 
And all that to do is so convenient. All that to do is go walk down to the computer lab, wait in line, and get on the computer, and then you know, log on and be able to send an email. Uh, can it get any more convenient than that to use you know, like that? So yes, times have changed, and uh, and uh, it's, it's but it has been amazing to see how how strong the school is doing, how well it's doing. I really appreciate uh, the walk we took earlier, Steve, to uh, see that. Uh, so I studied here, not Asian studies, but philosophy, and I used to make this joke back then, I don't know if they still do it, that if you study philosophy as a major, you'll never get a job, but at least you'll know why. And, uh, <laughs> I have to admit, there were a couple hard years as I uh, tried to get my career going, but uh, the overwhelming majority of my career, I did eventually find a profession and, and establish a career, and the overwhelming majority of my working life has now been in the field of studying China and Asia. And you know, I want to open by saying that throughout all my studies, throughout all my analysis, I think some of the most fascinating developments that, that, are, that have occurred over the span of uh, 30 years since China really started moving on this post-Mao era, uh, on post-Mao trajectory, some of the most fascinating developments have been occurring in the past couple of years. So you young people who are just getting into the field and, and studying, this is an excellent, just a really great time to be a, uh, a, a student of China and Asia. And uh, some of the developments are really going to shape history for a long time. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to explore some of that with you. So it's not, a, it's not an accident that Asian studies is becoming more and more popular. Uh, certainly when I was here 20 years ago, China studies field was very small. There I think one or two professors here. There was no China house, there was none, none, nothing like that. Uh, it was still an era in which the Cold War was fresh on people's minds. The Soviet Union ended in 1990, thereabouts. And we Mary, like schools around the country, had pretty big European studies departments. Uh, I, I studied French and lived in the French house. Uh, even though I was cur curious about China and I actually started taking some classes, mainly for personal reasons. My mother was from Taiwan. Um, but there weren't options uh, back then to really develop expertise as an Asia expert. And, uh, and, and times have changed, and, and I think rightfully so. Ch Asia is the future uh, of, of the world in many ways. It's where more and more economic activity is going to be driven. It's where a lot of the politics that concern the stability of the world it's going to be located, and it's an area that we need to understand well if we are going to manage the challenges um, facing the U.S. and the world uh, in the coming years. So I have to uh, admit, I have a little bit of presumption in claiming to offer some thoughts on one of the most important of those relationships in Asia, and that's the U.S. and Chinese relationship. I think no other relationship is going to influence the future of world politics and the prospects for, for peace and for economic, stability, economic growth and political stability, no relationships are going to impact that more than the U.S.-China relationship. And I admit, while it's a little presumptuous of me to offer some thoughts, I was trained as an undergrad at a certain school to, to think big and think bold, and uh, so I, I owe some of that presumption to my training as a philosophy student here. So uh, that's a little overview uh, on that slide of what we're going to talk about. Um, the subject is China's changing approach to international leadership. And what does that mean for the U.S.-China relationship? I do think their approach to international leadership is changing in very significant ways, dramatic ways. But in order to understand why this is happening, why are the Chinese uh, government uh, taking new policies and, and new approaches, and why is the U.S.-China relationship appearing to feel stress, and it is feeling stress, I think it's absolutely essential that we understand the historical and strategic context for some of the policies that, are, that we're seeing uh, being pursued under Xi Jinping. And we're going to talk about some of that. So let's start with some history. It's very important to, to bear in mind when you study Chinese foreign policy that a lot of uh, the thinking, traditional thinking about foreign policy was shaped by this history that's hinted at at this graph. So, since the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, much of the history of modern China has been one of relative poverty, hardship, disasters, and uh, disorder. And this, I think, has very profoundly shaped a lot of the thinking 
politically in China, especially about foreign policy for, for many decades, even through the early Deng Xiaoping years. Um, and, and I've listed some of the central tenets on this slide. For many decades, Chinese foreign policy was to avoid leadership. The Chinese were not interested in any kind of international leadership because they had so many issues to deal with domestically. And you read, you know, those of you who have already studied Chinese foreign policy, you'll recognize some of these tenets in the Deng Xiaoping area especially. There's this, there's this idea that what you see coming through these concepts is this idea that China doesn't want anybody to mess with it, and it's not interested in messing with anybody else. And that's, as long as things are stable, and the country can keep focusing on internal development, that's really the extent of Chinese ambitions. And it worked uh, for China, I would argue, for many years. It's kind of the it's tenet that gets quoted a lot in the press. Hide your time, buy your, cap you know, buy your time, hide your capabilities, hide and buy. That kind of sums up this philosophy. Is maintain a low international profile and just focus on development. Well, China succeeded in getting its development uh, in order, and it succeeded in a very spectacular fashion. So now we're going to come and talk a little bit about some of the strategic context for these developments. So since 1979, China has been on this phenomenal path of rapid growth. This chart gives you a, a, a sense of just how dramatic that growth has been. Uh, this chart starts from 1980 as opposed to the previous chart, which went all the way back to 1949. But what is really striking, here's kind of the strategic context, is China's rapid growth is occurring against a backdrop in which U.S. growth has slowed down considerably. If you measure by purchasing power parity, um, by some measures, on IMF, uh, China's, the size of China's economy is larger than the U.S. Now, of course, obviously, in nominal terms, real terms, the U.S. economy is larger than China, about 17 trillion, and China is, I think, like 11 trillion. Uh, and, and there are you know, questions of whether you should use PPP, you know, there's debates about uh, how accurate that is, but the bottom line is that the disparity between the China, size of the China's economy, economy and the size of the U.S. economy is narrowing, and has been narrowing dramatically in the past few years. China's getting bigger. It's the second largest economy in the world. And the U.S. growth rate is, is slowing down as a maturing economy. It's happening to all maturing economies. Europe, I mean, U.S. is doing better by far compared to some of our uh, partners in the industrial west and in Japan. And they, their growth rate has, has dramatically slowed down. But uh, in all likelihood in coming years, even as China's growth rate slows down as well, the range at which it will grow there's a very good chance that, that this gap will continue to narrow. Even if the U.S. grows at you know, 2% or 3%, and China decelerates down to 4 or 5% growth, and who knows what the actual numbers are. I, I'm not claiming that's what's going to happen. But the Chinese growth rate will slow down. The U.S. You know, will keep going, probably around that range, you know, 1 to 3%. That gap is going to continue to narrow. That's one important point about strategic context. Um, Here's the second uh, important point about the strategic context. Not only is the U.S. growth rate slowing down, but the, all of the West, industrial West, Europe and Japan and the U.S. basically, uh, their share of world GDP continues to shrink. And the, not just China, but a lot of the non-West is growing. So you are facing the possibility, in fact, according to the economists, this has already happened. Uh, again, you use PPP. If you don't use PPP, then uh, you know, probably in the next few years, you'll have this point where the emerging economies, non, the non-West, is going to overtake the West in terms of share of global GDP, with just sheer size. Um, and in a way, that'll, that'll close a historic era in which America and the West dominated the world economy. And that lasted about 150 years, so in the mid-1800s. Uh, the West took off on this trajectory. And, 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 and left a lot of the world behind. And now we're coming to a period where that, that is possibly coming to a close, very, very likely is starting to come to a close. So it's a very important strategic context that Chinese uh, are aware of this moment, and they anticipate it, and they see it, and lot, not just China, but a lot of the, the developing world, and, uh, and raise the question, what's gonna happen? 
Something else is, is worth bearing in mind as we think about why is China changing its foreign policy. So we've seen some very important geostrategic trends. Um, China is the second largest economy, now has its interests spread around the world. So remember we talked about in the first few decades how the Chinese foreign policy trying to avoid getting involved in the world. Well, that's not sustainable anymore. That kind of mentality is, it doesn't work for China because look, they're interests are all over the world. They cannot ignore the world, even if they wanted to. Um, their share of trade dependence, that's the share of the GDP that depends on trade is among the highest in the world. And for the second largest economy, that's a lot of money that is vulnerable around the world. Their dependence on energy has increased over time. So they, they, they not, like two, early 2000, 2002 or three, they started importing more than exporting oil. And that's trade, and that dependence on energy, overseas energy has increased. And then more and more of their citizens, as their trading and uh, economic activity expands around the world, more and more uh, Chinese citizens are, are living around the world. And they are starting to be subject to, uh, to the shocks that <coughs> happen in parts of the country. Libya, 2011, uh, we had this uh, crisis situation, and the Chinese government for the first time sent its military to evacuate its people. And uh, Yemen, again, 2015, they, they evacuated the people. So their interests are all over the world, and the Chinese government is under pressure by its own people to, to uh, protect those people, those Chinese citizens around the world. And the Chinese government is very acutely aware that if they fail to think about how do you protect these interests around the world, they could be vulnerable to severe shocks and disruptions in their own economy. So, um, all right. So, how how will how will all of this affect the international order? China, I want to emphasize, has been by and large a uh, upholder of a lot of the institutions uh, in the international order. They're, they're a member of the United Nations, and uh, you know they are very strong supporters. I would argue for that institution. There's no evidence they want to overthrow or overturn that. Uh, they support WTO, they benefit enormously from WTO, World Trade Organization, and uh, a lot of the economic related international institutions, uh, international law, trade laws, and they support, but the, the Chinese have always, like a lot of non-Western countries, have been ambivalent about a lot of the liberal values that underpin this order. So the US and Europe are by and large responsible for setting up you know, this kind of alphabet soup of institutions that I put up here. And those institutions reflect the influence of their, uh, their leaders, who, of those countries that establish them. They often have this implied preference for supporting human rights around the world, supporting democracy as the preferred form of government around the world. And the Chinese don't necessarily share that. So when you bear in mind this kind of ambivalent view about, about, this, uh, about the values underpinning the international order um, in, in, in the context of all these other trends, um, and to layer on top of that, this ambivalence probably is growing as the Chinese watch the, a lot of the elements of the international order start to deteriorate. So anybody who opens a newspaper today will see that uh, there is an alarming, I would argue a very alarming spread of disorder in many parts of the world. And a lot of problems seem entrenched and don't, there doesn't seem to be a way out of them. We're, at, we're in the multi, what, five, six years since global financial crisis and the economy of the world is still kind of stuck in this slow growth mode. Global economy is shaking up countries all around the world from the US to Europe to China to all over the place. <coughs> Transnational threats seem to grow without, without really coming under control. You have global climate issues, the ISIS, terrorism, these, and the Syria refugee crisis. <coughs> So this is an international order that seems to be declining in effectiveness. And here's China's challenge. And this is the order that they, to date, for decades, relied on to, to protect a lot of their interests. They, you know, kind of the bargain they had was, hey, as long as you don't mess with China, US, you know, we're not going to interfere with what you're trying to do. Let's keep the global trade going and try and keep order around the world. <coughs> uh, on multiple fronts, that approach is, Apparently, increasingly appears unsustainable. And not only that, 
is throw out another strategic development that is weighing on the minds of Chinese leaders. Competition in this era of slow economic growth is growing increasingly fierce between great powers. All these countries, US, Japan, Europe, China, are competing on many levels, but part of the things they're competing for are these dwindling export markets that to help drive their economies back into higher growth. <coughs> In Asia, which is the area that China cares most about, you're having this intensifying competition between the US and China over economic and security issues. This chart shows you that economically, the region has changed dramatically in the past 15 years. 2000, top trade partner for all our allies was the US or Japan. 15 years later, it's China. China feels like now it's the top leader in, in Asia's economy, <coughs> it should have more say in how the terms of trade are organized. It's proposed a, uh, a trade initiative, the RCEP, Regional uh, Cooperative, uh, it'll come back to be the RCEP, is, is China's trade initiative. And then we have the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you know, Trans Partnership, TPP, uh, which is the US preferred. So US argues, Congress China says, uh, we think that our trade terms are better for the region and better for the U.S. And so this competition is intensifying over how the regional uh, economic uh, organization, organization should look in the future. And then security-wise, the U.S. alliance system was built on this assumption that the U.S. would be the top economic leader in Asia. And now that that is increasingly not true, uh, the Chinese are, are growing vocal in criticizing a, a legacy security architecture that they argue is dangerous to China, is threatening to China, and, and destabilizing, and they're, they're proposing alternatives. Uh, and they have come out with a new Asia security concept, and they've rolled out initiatives, the, the KiCA, the, the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building, and uh, Six Party Talks, and SCO, which is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and multiple <coughs> security forums that they argue is much better suited to handle Asia security, and the U.S. vigorously disagrees. In fact, the U.S. announced a rebounds to Asia to counter what it saw as growing Chinese influence and short U.S. support. So competition is intensifying in this region. So, so where does that leave China's leadership? They're surveying the history, they're watching these trends, they're seeing their growing economic needs, and they're, they're seeing this intensifying competition. And you have to ask, if you are a Chinese decision maker, what alternative is there to try to step up your China's influence and leadership in the world? You know, it's not sustainable to simply rely on the West that's, that's uh, weakening and, and uh, seems its ability to manage the orders in question. It's, it's not, you can't afford to ignore your growing vulnerabilities and the demands of your citizens. And you, and you can't not compete with the U.S. and the other country. It's a competitive, this is big, big, big country politics. Everybody's competing. you got to play the game, and the Chinese are. <laughs> and, and then I want to mention this on this next slide, not only do the Chinese realize they need to start articulating uh, a vision and demonstrate more leadership to protect its own interests, there is a long-standing Chinese, uh, very rich and proud tradition of being a great power. So China is very comfortable, it has been for centuries, operating as a great power, as a dominant power in Asia. And the Chinese leadership is determined to get there again. They, they see a, a century break, century two century break, where the country ex experienced enormous disruption and disorder. <coughs> and they're determined to find ways to, to revitalize China as a great power. This is kind of the dream that the Chinese call it, the Chinese dream, at least under Xi Jinping. But, Essentially, it's an idea of making China a prosperous and powerful country. It really comes down to, in my view, the idea of elevating the standard of living of Chinese people and making the country have the status and influence of a great power. Uh, this is a project that's not new, which uh, didn't start with Xi Jinping. Um, Deng Xiaoping, uh, under him, you saw the first term Chinese national rejuvenation really uh, came to be a policy ideal. Carried through Jiang and Hu Jintao eras. But under Xi Jinping, what has happened is the old method of trying to get there had broken down. There's a domestic reform agenda, which is by and large, it's not actually new. <coughs> Even under Hu Jintao, there's a recognition that, that the mode of economic growth was unsustainable. 
export and, and investment driven growth could not last. They needed to move what he calls scientific development, they didn't move in a direction of more balanced growth, uh, consumer driven growth, and that required some very difficult reforms, but he was unable to make that happen using traditional methods of you know, coming to, to people and, and asking officials to change the ways. In fact, the, the ideal of governance as a core requirement of the Chinese Communist Party occurred under Hu Jintao, and, and, and that actually was a fruit of, of a lot of thinking in these circles under Chiang Zemin. I've written a whole book on this new paradigm shift. To me, the, the most important paradigm shift for Chinese Communist Party since it was founded in 1921 happened in 2002 under Hu Jintao when they adopted this paradigm that the CCP is now a governing party. No longer a revolutionary party. Its job is to provide governance for the people. However, even though Hu Jintao realized corruption is getting out of control and, and uh, you know, officials were not very good at responding to people's needs, he was not able to push through reforms, uh, you know, very dramatic, drastic reforms, in order to start improving governance and getting the economy growing on a sustainable basis. Xi Jinping is, is trying. So he's got his, he's got his uh, reform agenda, a big part of his domestic. He's cracking heads over any corruption, and he's, he's uh, you know, really disrupting the political system. In some ways, you could argue that you know, some disruption was unavoidable if he's going to get through some of these big structural systemic reforms. But uh, it's no guarantee he's going to succeed. He's run into serious tailwinds. Um, and it's very, to me, it's very hard to say how this is going to turn out. It's some very entrenched opposition, guys who have benefited from the old way of doing business, and they don't want to, they don't want to uh, quit. And uh, Xi Jinping has got his hands full of dealing domestically with, with these issues. But the situation for China is so complex that they cannot separate out a domestic from international reform. So the Chinese realize that in order to succeed domestically, they also need to address international issues for the country to grow. There are obstacles to growth that are international. I'll talk a little bit about that. So the, the uh, leadership, Xi Jinping, he's, you know, he's been very active and very vigorous in coming out with all these directives on, okay, here's how when you start kind of updating the foreign policy. And again, it's not all new. Xintao, came out with all these policy ideas, harmonious world, and, and there's real policy intent behind it, but it was, you know, a lot, a lot, oftentimes these were ideals without real clear guidance on, okay, what do you do to make this happen? Xi Jinping, the difference between Xi and who is he is much more clear about, okay, this is how we're gonna execute this. And then he issues directives, and things start, money starts moving, and people start doing things. Um, and, and to me, that's one of the biggest differences. So, to sum up, Kind of the, the trend under Xi Jinping, it's, uh, it's focused on revitalizing China's great power. And that involves two big imperatives. First off, how, uh, he, he's directed the, his officials to shape the international order in a way that supports this uh, desire to revitalize China's great power. <laughs> Here are some quotes directed from Xi, various venues you know, to that effect. And then the other very striking uh, development is this. Uh, imperative to defend and expanding a rate of core interests, national interests. And, um, we, certainly, those who follow the headlines have seen um, some of the policies that, come, that can be traced to this. We're going to talk briefly about a few of them. So, internationally, shaping the international environment, again, we're talking about upholding the basic infrastructure. The UN, WTO, the Chinese have, have been very consistent in expressing support for that. The ambivalence is more on those norms. Uh, the Chinese have shown much more willingness to contest the legitimacy of some of these norms of democracy and human rights. And here's some, ex you know, some politically, so uh, examples of that, I guess I'll talk about the next slide. Um, you know, the Chinese willingness to retaliate when leaders meet with the Dalai Lama or uh, other dissidents issued Nobel Peace Prize, the Chinese are much more willing to um, challenge uh, those governments and, and, and enact diplomatic penalties or economic, often unannounced penalties, in order to send a message. And the point of that is not just that the Chinese are very sensitive or prickly, it's, I think, to, to uh, make the point that that old system of values and norms that the U.S. and the West have long assumed to be permanent, 
that consensus is breaking down. And the Chinese are making that point that, hey, the West, you always assume we all believe and supported your point of view. We don't. And that, that era is coming to a close, and we need to accept the reality that a lot of countries don't share this mindset. And you and you know, China and all of us need to figure out what is the new consensus. And it's not that. It's something different. <clears throat> but they're doing more than just that. They, they are doing uh, very constructive work in, in a political uh, mediation and getting involved around the world. Uh, this is a, a very striking moment under Xi Jinping. The Chinese officials are getting involved in mediating in Afghanistan, in Sudan. They're, they're helping, trying to bring civil wars to a close. Uh, they were involved with the Iran nuclear agreement. Even on security, uh, the Chinese continue to send large numbers. They're the number one uh, contributor of troops to the United Nations peacekeeping operations. Um, they worked on the Paris Agreement. And then, uh, and then economically, there's a very striking development driven partly, as I mentioned, there's this link between economic, domestic, and tr uh, international policy. Um, these big initiatives, one by one role, uh, AIB, et cetera. <coughs> and and they, I think they are following those trends. They would like to see a lot of the international order while they support it. They wanted to move in a direction that they think more fairly represents Chinese power. It doesn't simply re reflect the status of the U.S. and Europe. So I mentioned that this kind of uh, defensive core interest, this has grabbed a lot of headlines in the South China Sea. Um, the Chinese are eager to expand their presence so that their, their posture to be able to influence what happens in Southeast Asia, an area that's expected to, to be a huge driver of global growth in coming years. Um, the Chinese want to have more security for some of their key slots, the sea, la sea lines of communication upon which their trade depends. Um, and they want to, uh, they also, I, you know, I, I think they do want to establish a, a stronger security perimeter out further out to sea. Uh, they want to, they certainly have no beef with humbling Japan to the extent they can do that in the East China Sea. They announced the ADIS and have stepped up pressure on the Senkakus. Japan's an old adversary of the Chinese. <coughs> and then I mentioned some of the political retaliation. I think the point of it is to demonstrate that there's that the old consensus doesn't hold anymore about what are the values and norms that, that should govern international relations, and that there needs to be thinking about what is the new basis of, of conducting those kind of relationships. Um, very striking is a uh, growing willingness to deploy military forces outside the country. In 2015, the Chinese announced their first military base. It's kind of a supply point, is probably the more accurate term. And uh, this is a typo, Djibouti. Uh, uh, but uh, they, they've had uh, flotillas, uh, you know, naval ships out uh, near the Horn of Africa since 2009. This is, again, relatively new developments for China. For a country that we saw in the previous decades, they were not interested in putting troops outside the country. In fact, their military was, could not do it, even if, if it was asked. They simply had no capability. All right, so very interesting. So we're seeing this uh, evolving uh, leadership uh, mindset on the importance of China taking a more active role in international relations, demonstrating more leadership. Again, I want to, you know, I want to emphasize that compared to what the U.S. does, it's not even on the same level. The U.S. has been operating as a global leader uh, for decades and was the single largest power that had, had this unique polar moment you know, after the Cold War, and that lasted for a while. It's, I would argue it's coming to a close, or if it hasn't already. The U.S. is much more comfortable operating as a global leader. The Chinese are doing some things you know, on these different fronts. It's a big break from their past, but um, again, compared to the U.S., it's, you know, there's still a huge gap in, in what the U.S. is able to provide and what China's learning and, and trying to do. Nevertheless, this change in uh, leadership has some big implications for U.S.-China relations. And uh, I'm going to talk about, about that. So. So, historically, when you have the situation of an established power and a rising power, uh, historically not necessarily been good use for international stability. Um, there is that potential, although it's really way too early to say if there's going to be any trouble. 
Um, this chart is merely meant to highlight that there is growing parity on a level that the U.S. has not seen with another country for decades. Even the Soviets were really, in many ways, a one-dimensional power, largely military, and had the economic strength. The demographics were not, not, not on the size of China. They didn't invest in, this, in all the, the full range of capabilities and, um, and trying to be technologically advanced and a real technological driver innovator uh, to really be a competitive in the cultural front. <laughs> and even though and this chart I got from the Guardian, I didn't claim to make up this chart, um, even though the U.S. clearly is uh, the most powerful country, and the Chinese would acknowledge this, by far the most powerful country today, um, that gap that we talked about early on, the, the resource gap that's narrowing over time, will continue to narrow, and the Chinese will, will continue to improve and get better at many things. We've seen that advances on the military front. Um, the Chinese are getting better and, and, and learning how to develop higher end technologies. Certainly, the, again, the U.S. is by far the leader, but uh, the competition is intensifying. Anybody who's seen some of these new Chinese cell phones are really impressive. And they're taking a lot of the uh, development world by storm. Um, the Xiaomi, is one of the most famous brand. Chinese cultural products. Um, Still nowhere near on the level of Hollywood, but getting very good. Those of you who have Netflix, there's, there, you can log on to see some Chinese movies. There's some available. The production value is very impressive. I, I saw, you know, I looked at a few, and uh, you know, somewhere like World War II, the Chinese seem to have an endless budget on war movies with Japan. You know, lots of these movies. But the, just the technological production alone is very impressive. It looks like Saving Private Ryan, and all the special effects. It, they're getting better and better. And again, they're still really just getting started. So we've got a couple of decades ahead where this gap is going to narrow, this competition is going to intensify. But what I want to emphasize is that it's not just competition. This is the two largest economies in the world, uh, the most important countries in the world for dealing with a number of issues. And the relationship between US and China is getting increasingly complex. The cooperation imperatives are growing. Trade relations and investment relations are getting even more intricate, interwoven. The Chinese, by uh, some measures, now invest more money in the U.S. than we invest in China. And the Chinese, Chinese investments are building U.S. factories, employing American workers, just like American money has been employing Chinese workers for years. <laughs> Chinese consumers are becoming a more and more segment of the U.S. Uh, market, export market. GM sells more vehicles to Chinese consumers than they do American consumers. A lot of Hollywood movies make more money in China nowadays than they, did, than they do in the U.S., which is why you start to see more and more movies where you know, Superman also now has a Chinese friend and uh, this is all being uh, deliberately uh, developed to appeal to the Chinese market, which is becoming extremely critical to Hollywood. Um, so, and, and, and this chart shows uh, you know, Chinese are buying homes uh, in America, they, they were the largest source of purchasers of homes in the U.S., uh, far more than any other country. Um, you know, foreign, foreign purchasers of homes. So th the Chinese are, are becoming more important to America's economic growth and prosperity. And similarly, uh, the China, uh, U.S. remains critical as a, as a top export market for China. Um, and so that, that economic relationship is clearly getting more and more important. So we, we need each other uh, in order for our countries to keep growing. And then even outside economic issues, the U.S.-China relationship is, they admit, both leaderships realize that, hey, we need to work together. There's just too many issues going on, going on in the world, too many problems to add another problem of, of you know, real conflict between U.S. and China. There's, there's cooperation going on on, on many realms. I had a great conversation with some uh, faculty here talking about how U.S. and Chinese officials, after Xi and Obama met, have agreed to deconflict how they, they provide aid to different parts of the world. And that's another good example where they realize these are the two countries with the resources that can contribute the most to address a lot of problems, and they need to work together to deconflict and make, try and make some real progress on these things. Uh, U.S. and Chinese have been working side by side on counter piracy in the Horn of Africa. Um, there's more willingness to recognize that we need, there's a lot of shared incentive to deal with terrorism. Um, so that there's 
a more and more willingness to talk about how to deal with and work together. Um, climate change, we've, we've uh, seen that in the headlines. So there's a lot of issues where the U.S. and Chinese have a strong incentive to work together. The U.S. has a lot to talk about. Obviously, it brings a lot to the table. We have the experience. The U.S. has the experience. We have allies and partners around the world. The Chinese don't have that. The Chinese have resources, though, and our allies and partners increasingly don't, or are really strapped. Um, so there's, there's a lot of reason for us to work together outside of just the economic relationship. Nevertheless, I, I think it, it is a very important fact that the relationship in other ways is deteriorating and the competition is intensifying. Um, so part of the reason is, is this issue. Lead, leadership by definition in many ways is kind of a zero-sum thing. Either you accept one set of values and one kind of leadership or you accept a different one. And there's compromises you can make to, and you're going to have to make to try to work through, well, okay, who is going to be the leader? Um, to date, the U.S. is still the, the top power and its leadership is recognized by all countries, but there is growing friction. And I think the, reason, you know, the frustration on the Chinese part is growing, and you see that in the policy. Chinese have, in some ways, while working in the existing system, are increasingly willing to work outside. When they, when they get frustrated with the U.S. and Japanese blocking them on certain policies, they'll say, okay, you know what, that's fine. You guys keep doing your business, we're going to set up alternative, and we can work through that, not to deal with pushback or you know, efforts by whatever country to try and you know, get in the way of you know, decisions that Chinese feel is best for its interests. Um, so this chart is, uh, I got this from the Mercator Institute. Um, there are numerous institutes, and, and AIB, and various initiatives that have, that Chinese has set up that they feel is more responsive to their needs instead of uh, the U.S. And, and its allies' needs. And that's a symptom of this, this competition that's intensifying. Very, very striking that the U.S. response to a lot of these initiatives has been very revealing. You know, very ambivalent, questioning, skeptical, critical, you know, this, this hints at this intensifying competition. In the maritime disputes, South China Sea, I don't need to say a lot about it. People read the news, it's in there a lot. Cyber disputes, so what I want to say about this, underpinning all these disputes, often what you see is that these are symptoms of this diverging view of how should the rules and how should the international order be set up? And the U.S. says it, it should be this way, and Chinese have followed rules, and China say, hey, look, those are rules are out of date. They're reflected in an era where the U.S. and the ally, its allies were the top powers, and nobody else was a contender. We need to update those rules. And this is, I think, underpins a lot of these disputes and disagreements. You read the fine text of what, what the leaders of both countries say. And they, they will be very explicit. She, uh, sorry, uh, President Obama has said, China needs to follow the rules. It makes my point. I mean, he's saying, in, in essence, there are certain rules that have worked for the U.S. mainly, and China should follow those. And the Chinese uh, read what they say. They say, hey, we support international rule. We, we support international law. However, the international laws and rules are a little out to date, and they need to be updated. Here are the principles we recommend that to be uh, used to update the meaning of international rules and laws. And they, they say that quite openly. Have cup cartoons kind of illustrate the mood, how it's shifting. And uh, it illustrates on these points. So you have some cartoons from China Daily. And uh, you know, I think it's very illustrative. And you could pick, I mean, they have so many of these cartoons, and I think they're actually really clever, really great. <clears throat> and, and what comes across in these points is several things. First, the Chinese feel that U.S. reaction to the fact that China's getting large, I mean, look, China's basically as large as the U.S. in most of these pictures, is, is irrational. It's uh, taking policies that are kind of self-destructive. This top graphic makes that point. Um, you know, this is kind of very abstract meta narrative of the U.S. This international, U.S. led international order kind of crumbling, and rather than trying to fix it, or help China build something better, it's, it's in, in getting in China's face and, and you know, criticizing China. Or, or it's threatening in this picture. Here the U.S. is trying to hit China, and China is trying to be non-violent and deflect and, uh, and avoid a fight. And then look at the boat. It's rocking. And I think there's some text on that that said, you know, if this keeps up, this boat's going to tip over. So there's this sense, China's the victim. The U.S. is kind of uh, dangerous, unpredictable, a little aggressive. And, uh, threatening, 
and uh, his behavior is threatening to derail everything. And this kind of speaks to this you know, suspicion that things are very un, you know, unhealthy on both sides, that you know, the other country, not sure how this relationship is going to work. And here's the U.S. So the U.S. has its own critics and, and uh, you know, uh, voices that are wary of China. And again, to kind of illustrate my point, the thing that comes out of these cartoons, and again, there are lots of them out there, is this idea that here's the U.S. It's the victim this time, of course. It's China who is breaking the rules, who is not following everybody, you know, what the U.S. thinks everybody should do, and uh, is threatening. It's, it's you know, stealing, or it's, or it's uh, going to call in debt and humiliate the U.S. And, uh, and she, he said this anxiety, again, in the U.S. population, which fortunately, I, I think, on both sides, it's not the dominant mood. And, and one of my recommendations is we need to think about ways to make sure that this suspicion and, and the enmity does not grow. Because that's very dangerous. But I, let's, let's come to the wrap up now. So I've talked about these trends. I've talked about how the U.S.-China relationship, always complex, is getting even more complex. There's very powerful incentives for both sides to cooperate and work together. There's, there is a reality of intensifying competition and, uh, and suspicion. Um, the good news is I do think that overall the level of, of suspicion and distrust is not as high as it has been in the past. Remember the Cold War and the U.S. and Chinese went through a terrible episode of, of war, the Korean War, and uh, the ideological antagonism was extremely intense. It's not at that level right now, nor is it comparable to U.S.-Soviet era, where there's intense acrimony and, and uh, hostility and hatred is often, and ideological fervor and crusades. That's not the case here either, and that's, I think, a good thing. Um, historically, historically, one of the most powerful drivers of conflict is when the peoples of two countries have decided that country, the other country, is an enemy, is an enemy, is a threat, and is a competitor that would intend to use its resources to harm the other country in a potentially lethal way. And when your peoples of two countries take that attitude. They punish leaders who don't do to, to carry out policies to do exactly that, to start harming each other. And uh, the good news, I think, is that the U.S. and China, uh, people are not at that point. There's a great deal of, um, on the popular level, goodwill towards each other. Uh, I found that firsthand when I traveled in China and saw museums uh, built in China dedicated to the, uh, to the all-volunteer force, all-volunteer all force in uh, World War II. The entire museums where Chinese remember. Most Americans have forgotten who still, they don't even know who still will us. Most Chinese can tell you who uh, and who are Joe still will us. And there are entire museums where, where they pay homage to what America did to help China fight in World War II. And in the, in the American side, too, right? there are growing numbers of Americans eager to learn about Chinese culture and travel to China. And, and I find, even in the military, a lot of American military officers tell me, they, I just don't see why we should ever want to get in a fight with China. And these are very senior military guys. People think they're all hawks. That's not true. I've met a lot of military guys who are very thoughtful about this relationship. So I think that's a good sign. But it is important to, uh, to, to find ways to continue exchanges and continue to find ways to uh, uh, avoid the, the possibility that this uh, sentiment of mutual hostility you know, taking root in the people. Um, if we look at the literature, international relations literature, I'm not an IR expert, but I have looked at it quite a bit. Um, this so-called Thucydides trap is not inevitable. This is a term, for those who are familiar with it, it's this idea that an established power becomes this jealous of a rising power, and it's this fundamental jealousy and resentment that leads to conflict. It came from a, a Greek historian who talked about Sparta and Athens and, and the Peloponnesian War. And uh, the, the theory is that whenever you have established a rising power, there are always going to be more. I don't think that's true. And if you look at this, the historical data, um, there are situations where uh, that power transition can be very dangerous and, and destructive. We cannot totally rule it out, I think, in the U.S.-China case, uh, and I'll acknowledge that. Um, the, the real dangerous moment would, would come if after a period, the Chinese believe that they are the, they have got to the point where they should really be the system leader. And usually that, the telltale signs are this country, that, that, 
that the innovation in the technological uh, leading edge of the global economy is now being done by the rising power, not the established power. And that the size of the economy, uh, the, the innovation, the, the, uh, the real leadership and the ability to solve problems is, is being done by this rising power, not by the established power. And uh, China's, I think, very far from that right now. They, they are still uh, lagging. Uh, this is a really critical issue for them, their, their ability to compete with the U.S. technologically. I heard a great quote from a Chinese official in the newspaper. I read it. He said, uh, you know, the problem for China is that we can recruit from 1.5 billion people to help with technological innovation. The U.S. can recruit from 4.5 billion people to help with this technological innovation. I, I think that it speaks to an enduring strength of the U.S. and something that China is going to continue to struggle with uh, doing. But, I mean, in the event, if, if their economy really takes off and, and they're able to solve this technological hurdle, it, you could get a more dangerous situation in a couple of decades from now. But uh, short of that, um, I tend to be more optimistic that we can manage this relationship and there's going to be friction. You know, this term frenemy gets thrown around a lot. I think that's you know, kind of apt describe the fact that there is antagonism and uh, friendship going on at the same time in this relationship. And uh, I think that's going to persist. The most difficult area is going to be Asia. South China Sea is really, um, the disputes there is kind of a, uh, it's really a microcosm of, of issues that, are, that are, are bubbling up around the Asia between U.S. Chinese visions of how that area should evolve. And uh, that will continue to be, I think, the most difficult area to manage um, outside of Asia prospects for cooperation look much better. Uh, we're seeing that already. The U.S. and China are working together on, on a lot of problems around the world. Um, but uh, any, uh, any, any of your questions, uh, that concludes my discussion. I look forward to uh, talking more with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, for that very thoughtful overview of key themes that I think we all know are sort of there, but we haven't put them all together like that. And uh, I think it should provoke a lot of questions. So we'd like to go first. And maybe I'll start if anyone else this often has to happen the chair just gets it going. So uh, I have a question about your view of the current economic issues in China. So one counter argument to the idea that there's sort of a 10 to 20 year period in which China's economic growth will continue at 5%. And U.S. at two, three percent, so you kind of get that overlap, you know, very Thucydian way. You know, another view, which is much more pessimistic, is that the Chinese economic crisis is far more severe um, because of uh, bad loans and uh, a real difficulty in shifting the model away from the dependence on still state-owned enterprises, despite changes uh, that are quite dramatic. There's still a fairly significant amount of the Chinese economy that is not competitive and needs to be propped up for reasons of social stability. Uh, and banks have overstretched to kind of um, continue that support, uh, so a lot of those uh, uh, you know, uh, investments may not be recouped. Um, so what do you think to, about those pessimists? And uh, if they're wrong, uh, does that mean that the U.S. legal system, sort of leadership of the global system is likely to be sustained for a lot longer? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, and. Uh, I'm aware of these uh, predictions, very credible as an economist, Mike Pettis, who I have a lot of respect for, talks about the real dangers of kind of a, a Japan disease. And that is where the debt just becomes so massive that it starts to affect economic growth. And, and the Chinese economy moves into a kind of a stagnation. Uh, still grows, you know, zero to one percent though, as opposed to these high rates. And I, I think that is a real problem, a real risk. I think the risk is growing as evidence comes out that uh, the Chinese continue to struggle with enacting the systemic reforms. It is, uh, you know, Xi Jinping had a lot of a lot of momentum at first to try and ram through some of these changes, but it, you know, the evidence is, is clear that it is, it is going to be really difficult for them to, to break up these SOEs and, and force this restructuring and end all these bad loans, as you talked about. It's really kind of the crux of the problem. Is, a lot of the lending is politically driven. If the Chinese cannot find a way to break that up and end that politically driven loan, they're going to accumulate so much debt that it will be impossible for them to pay it off and it will, it will start to stifle economic growth. Um, and I think that's a real risk. Uh, I don't think that, that foretells a collapse even in that scenario. I think you know, Japan, I 
they, they've limped along for decades since then. And, uh, the standard of living for many of the people continue to grow. But uh, the growth rates will come down. And, uh, and then this question of you know, this overlap and possible conflict, I think that becomes even less likely in a lot of you in that scenario. Thank you. Uh, Professor Chung? No, I'll just keep going back to the mic. You can also identify yourself. Okay, uh, TJ Chan from the government department. Uh, early on, you sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, look at the uh, geostatistical landscape there, and you seem to imply that, uh, to argue that uh, the, uh, it's a sort of a zero-sum game, uh, whether the you know, United States top dog or China is starting to replace it or not. Uh, uh, for the other issue area, trade, you know, economic exchange, that sort of thing, typically it's a sort of win-win situation, right? So, but uh, look at the, the sort of two exercises that you mentioned earlier on, TPP versus uh, RCEP, regional company comprehensives of partnership things. Uh, uh, the United States is excluded from the RCEP negotiation, and China is excluded from the TPP so far at least. So are you seeing, you know, sort of the nature of the game there, it's also zero sum now? Very good question, and I do think this is one of the most striking developments in the economic relationship is as much as there are increasing investment in, in our trade, the relationship is turning from one that was largely complementary in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, and, and there's a relationship in which China, as the workshop of the world, took American loans, money, built factories, uh, produced a lot of uh, things cheaply, footwear, toys, clothes, all kinds of stuff, and shipped it to America, to get American money to come back into China to build more factories and, and, and produce more. So we incurred a lot of debt, uh, but in, a, in return, Americans got a lot of cheap goods. And, and there's kind of, a, in a way, it's complementary and, and a mutually beneficial relationship. Now, China is increasingly uncompetitive in that, in that line of manufacturing. It's losing industry. Shoes, textiles, toys are leaving China. The wages are going up in China. They can't afford to make these things at the rates they used to. And they have competitors now, Southeast Asia, Africa. Uh, look at the labels on your shirts and clothes. The them still say China, but more and more, I'm finding labels that say India, Bangladesh, and other parts of the world. So China can't afford to keep that relationship going. This comes back to my earlier point. Domestic and international reform go together. So China wants to do what Japan did, what Taiwan did, what Hong Kong did. They want to move up the chain, the value-added chain, uh, economic chain. They want to move more into advanced manufacturing and do more services. Here's the problem. To, to do, uh, part of the problem is advanced manufacturing, technology-heavy uh, products, uh, a lot of the, the competitive advantage for a country um, has to do with international trade standards and rules. Right? So if the U.S. has the edge in, uh, in kind of shaping those trade rules and standards, it benefits its industries and allows its industries to compete. Look at iPhone. So U.S. influence in kind of stand, uh, setting trade standards, uh, tech standards around the world, allows Apple to penetrate markets rapidly around the world. Now, if you're China and you're the second largest economy and you want to get in on that game, you can see that, wow, in a way, this game is kind of rigged. My analogy I like to use for this is, if you imagine two football teams, and one team owns the ref, you can see how that advantage goes to that team who owns the ref, who can say, okay, hey, you know, I know, I know a passing has been very uh, uh, great for scoring points for both teams, but my team has, has got a terrible quarterback. We are going to change the rules now and say, uh, you know, passing only gets you one point. If you can run the ball, you get six points. And then all of a sudden, the team that owns the rep can, can start out competing again. And you know, it's very telling. Obama himself has said, it's very, again, think about what this means. He said, when everybody follows the rules for trade, America always wins. The Chinese see that in a different way than the way Obama intended, which is, OK, we got it. When you own the rules, of course you always win. So this comes back to TPP and RCEP. And, and it's being replicated, this kind of competing on different levels, where uh, you see in the newspapers disputes about uh, security backdoors and you know, tech standards of you know, how should the standards be set up for technology to allow exports of uh, products. And that competition is intensifying. As much as Chinese like can talk about win-win, um, there is a competitive element that suggests you know, there is some level of zero sum in the sense of 
who has the final authority on deciding a lot of these issues? And that's, I think, where the competition is intensifying and will continue to grow. Um, my name is Josh. I'm a student. So um, earlier you said that China might be contesting like um, U.S. and Western hegemony just over like international institutions, then things that have to do with like um, democracy and human rights, like the, that sort of thing. Like just because it might not agree with like Chinese policy, but I mean, like the U.S. and the West in general have been, you know, kind of a leading force for imperialism, colonialism, and like subjugating many peoples across the world to their interests. Um, pretty much by force, and have also been an open and also implicit <coughs> supporter of dictators around the world that have had no interest for human rights or democracy or anything like that. So, is any part of like the Chinese, um, like uh, I guess, non-alignment with these institutions? Could it just be from their vision, their vision that like, oh, this is hypocritical. You don't really support these values. You just do it when it's in your interest. Absolutely, I think. Uh Chinese share a lot of the resentment of the hypocrisy of the West that a lot of developing countries have long felt. I mean, they're, you know, just any Middle Eastern expert, or anybody from the Middle East, you ask them if there's been hypocrisy in the U.S. policy towards Middle East, of course, yes, and uh, in the West. Uh, and I think China plays to that. Uh, Xi Jinping's been very deliberate in saying that Chinese officials need to connect better with people around the developing world. And, and his argument has been, the rise of the non-West is going to bring in a new era where that old consensus that intervention on the basis of human rights or to support democracy, whatever the pretext is, whatever gives justification for a country to invade another, uh, China is saying, hey, that, those days are over and we need a new consensus that accounts for the abuse of rising countries. Now, here's the irony. All right, so hypocrisy is usually a luxury of the, of the powerful. When you're powerful, it's hard to be hypocritical. <laughs> China is already, remember this foreign policy that I talked about earlier? We don't, we don't get involved in any country, we don't intervene with anybody else. All right, so that's increasingly unsustainable. And China, as I mentioned, now they're building their foreign uh, military bases in Djibouti. Now they're sending troops in other parts of the country, but under the pretext of we're only here to promote world peace, but it's not a coincidence that they keep sending their troops in areas where they have lots of oil, where they have lots of mineral interests, and they have lots, lots of people. And they want to make sure that those are protected. So I think uh, the Chinese are going to be stressed. And this has been a, a luxury they've been able to enjoy, is to take the very moral high ground and criticize the West. And no doubt the West has done terrible, I mean, no, no question, there's been bad policies and terrible decisions and disasters. And uh, all kind of colossal uh, things have happened to detriment often of weaker countries. But as China gets more and more pulled into this realm of international leadership, it's going to find that this stance is a luxury. It will, it will be able to afford less and less. It's going to have to start making hard decisions about, okay, who do you support in this fight? And what are you going to do when your citizens are getting slaughtered? And what are you going to do with your military about this when your people at home are demanding action and demanding your government do something about <coughs> stopping the slaughter of your people? And they're going to find that uh, it's going to be hard to resist following policies similar to what America and the West have done to it. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but they're going to get more and more involved in these other countries, and they're going to be fighting, and they're going to, their military is already becoming more active in these other parts of the world. Hi, I'm Marty. I'm also a student, and I just sort of have two questions. One, you, first you mentioned that uh, China sort of differs from the West in sort of the values they uh, think are important for trade. That's why when you, they said when they heard Obama say, when, you follow, when China follows the rules, America wins, you, they saw that as hypocritical and sort of saying, we own the rules. But some of the rules that they're talking about are like the rules for intellectual property because China is extremely uh, prone in international trade for violating patent laws. So is that the kind of system? Wouldn't China also want patent laws if they were the trade leader of the world, the tech leader of the world? I would say that's uh, a value thing and just more of a trying to get power thing. And secondly, you mentioned uh, Xi Jinping was trying to reform the corruption in China, but he was implicated in the Panama Papers for offshore tax havens. So how is that? How do those two work together? Okay, so three questions. First one about uh, is it international trade rules and laws don't they work for China? And I would say many of them do, and the Chinese acknowledge that. Uh, they are getting more interested in IPR as, as they start getting into the business of, of building technology products. 
and they're seeing the value of it. So you know, the fact that they have qualms and disagreements with aspects of international trade and, and interpretations of, of norms and standards does not mean they want to throw it all out. I, I would say, like a lot of countries, they pick and choose what they like, what they want to support, and things that they want to see change to their benefit. Um, I think it's more, you know, so to, to give a clear illustration, U.S. trade standards that we advocate TPP and similar initiatives are designed uh, by US, you know, U.S. officials to design a, to uphold high labor standards and environmental standards. Chinese read that as code for saying, you can't compete with us on price, therefore, you're going to try and justify your higher expense by saying, hey, it's you know, higher environmental and labor standards so that we can't compete with you. And in a way, that's actually exactly right, but that's the kind of this issue of competing about, okay, look, who is who in an era of slow growth, in which your industries are are on you know life support to try and stay alive, and you're trying to get your country growing, and both countries have domestic issues where people are frustrated and angry at their governments. Having influence over those trade rules so that your company has the edge is becoming very important in order to allow you to grab a larger share of the export market. And the Chinese see that as part of the game; they want to play in that as well. Any questions on that side of the audience? Yes, I'm going to run around. One quick comment and then a question. Um, as someone who came out of the scientific background, um, and I was in infectious diseases, and I see the change in the primary literature coming out of China. I mean, it's like coming way ahead very fast. So we ought not to be complacent about where they are as soon as they get their quality control. They're serious about it. I think they're going to do this in a lot of ways. But my question to you really is more maybe with your philosophy background coming out of RAM. So, the, you know, the technological people, the highly trained people, are doing quite well in both countries. But both America is witnessed by our current politics, and China have a huge, back, a large proportion of their people who are increasingly dissatisfied with the government. Do you guys have good recommendations that you can give our leaders and maybe share with us about ways to minimize those problems on both sides? Um, that's kind of good. I'm sorry to answer your question about corruption, but um, <clears throat> you know, I wish I did. I, you know, I think every, every leader in every Western country would adopt it if they knew, but part of the problem is the reality of a post-industrial society is you lose once you've lost the manufacturing base that drove uh, the growth of the middle class. And that's really what every country has done. They've ridden the, the backs of a, a major manufacturing surge. They're usually labor or unionized or at least you know, better paying and uh, increasing productivity. They're able to build a huge middle class. And that, that has been the bulwark of a lot of, a lot of these Western liberal democracies in the US. Once you deindustrialize, and it's inevitable, I mean, no one can stay competitive in manufacturing forever. Once, yeah, basically, once you become middle class, you're no longer able to compete, right? I and mean, that's kind of the irony of it is you succeed too well, and then you're no longer competitive, and you have to lose those industries. China's going through that right now. They have a huge middle class. A lot of them benefit from manufacturing, and a lot of them hate manufacturing. You talk to the young people in China, they don't want to do that. They're going in graduate school and schools at record numbers. And the jobs aren't there. You think we have a problem with employing college graduates? It is a serious problem in China. That, that kind of gets to the social stability issue. There are a lot of educated Chinese people on the internet who are frustrated, aggravated, they can't find a job, and and then they get news you know, of corruption at higher levels. There's a reason why the Chinese media has been censoring tightly any news about Xi Jinping's connection to the Pan uh, Panama Papers. It's very sensitive, very sensitive. Inequality is a huge issue in China. The leader keeps leadership keeps promising that they're going to make inroads on this problem. They realize corruption is part of it. I mean, that's, that's I think the difference in China versus U.S. is that in China it's much more clearly tied to corruption. Um, the ability of at least to capture line the lion's share of economic growth for their own benefit is a major source of frustration and, and antagonism in their system. Um, you know, their country is exploring ways to essentially increase this, the uh, incomes of, of lower, uh, you know, lower wage people. And um, 
you know, I, I don't know any country that's really successfully worked its way through this. I, I think part of it is this issue of make, keeping your country competitive economically. This all comes back to these trade standards and rules and how do you set up trade and how do you compete, how do you get people educated. It's, it's becoming much more uh, complex. I, the only recommendations I have is, you know, a lot of it comes to this issue is if you are a post-industrial society and you want to keep growing, you need to stay competitive. You need to invest in your people, you need to invest in education, you need to make sure you are the leader in technology and innovation. And this is a lesson that all countries accept, and they're all, you know, all the Western and Asia uh, powerhouses are trying to carry out, and some succeed and some don't. It's a very tricky thing. You have South Korea that try to become a, and France try to become innovators in, in uh, uh, you know, semiconductors and that dumped billions of dollars in building factories to try and become the global leader and they fail. It's going to be a very expensive uh, competition, but um, for post-industrial societies, it's the only path is you need to outcompete. U.S., believe it or not, for all our problems, is still doing much better than virtually any other uh, Western country, by far, by far. Our prospects, the American prospects, look really good uh, compared to what's facing Europe, Japan, I mean, even China in the next few decades, they, things are going to start getting difficult as they start losing the demographic divide and uh, dividend and uh, start grappling with some aging issues. And, uh, and still, this, if they, even if they, assuming they solve this economic transformation and rebalance the economy, which is by no means assured. So I think we'll take one last question because there was one right here. And after that, I know some students had to run because of finals and all, but if the rest are still here, let's get together and have a small group discussion afterwards. So, last question, sir. Sorry, yes, David Weaver. I um, did follow up on the Panama paper and the flight of capital, $1 trillion last year from many of the people high up in the Communist Party. And the current article in your review of books, Crackdown in China, Worse and Worse, the question centers about Xi and seems from this article suggest that because of these many pressures, he's now trying to drive China back to mountains with the setup of several rather secretive committees prosecuting uh, many folks who simply don't agree with him. Com comments on that? Uh, there's a lot of analogy in the media of Xi Jinping and Mao Zedong. I, I tend to be very wary of that comparison because I, I think uh, it's not helpful at certain levels. I agree with you, he's centralizing power. There's certain things that are similar to Mao's centralizing power. He's, he's you know, pushing the study of his work, his political, ideological indoctrination. Um, he is uh, hauling people away in secret and going after all kinds of people, people who thought they were safe and protected, and, uh, and is enacting huge disruption of the bureaucracy. Those things Mao Zedong also did. However, I think it's worth emphasizing what Mao tried to achieve was something totally different than what Xi Jinping's trying to do. Xi Jinping's policy agenda at the end of the day, it is about continuing the path of modernization, continuing reform and opening up, making the, the economy actually work. I mean, this is the frustration in China is they want to keep growing. And, and if you just, if you told, if you told, well, this is what I like to tell people. If you wanted a leader who didn't challenge anything, didn't arrest anybody, and, and just asked people nicely, hey, will you stop being corrupt and you know, stop doing this? And there was a guy like that, his name was Hu Jintao. It didn't work. He tried that and it, the economy got worse and worse and the debt piled up. And Xi Jinping, and there's a consensus behind Xi Jinping, he's not acting on his own. The, the elites, I think, agree that they need a centralization power and they need a, a, a strong man approach to break things up and force through some very wrenching and difficult changes. You know, I, I'd like to point out to people that America went through something similar. All countries who go through this transformation uh, the breakup of the vested interests that, that benefited off the old way of doing things and, uh, and, and the transfer of wealth from the elite to the hands of the masses so they could start driving consumption is always politically extremely controversial, divisive, and often explosive. We went through this in the 1930s. Our president who oversaw this was FDR. And it was extremely divisive, controversial, and dangerous. I mean, there are lots of Americans still regard FDR as a socialist more extreme factions, but I mean, he took on elites, uh, and he did things that were extra legal, and it was extremely uh, controversial, and that's, 
That's in a de liberal democracy which has a lot more give in their political system and mechanisms to, to manage that tension than the Chinese system. Germans went through this in the 30s with very you know, shocking results, uh, horrible results in many ways. And, and the Chinese are finding also this is a very politically, this economic decision is a very political one. And it's extremely controversial, it's extremely destabilizing and uh, and Xi Jinping is finding that. These guys don't want to quit. He's telling these, just like Hu Jintao, all these SOEs who are accumulating all, all this bad debt, you need to stop doing this. Stop building these factories. Stop, you need to start firing these people because you can't afford it. Our country can't afford it. And these guys are saying, I don't care what you think. I'm, this is working for me, and I'm not going to do that. And they're very powerful. They got tons of money. And how, how do you deal with that? And you got lots of these guys. And they all work together, and they, they, don't, they don't want to stop. And uh, you know, I'm not sympathetic to Xi Jinping. He's you know, an autocrat. He's doing, you know, hauling in all these uh, dissidents and uh, suppressing a lot of voices. And but he's also popular in China. And what he's doing is popular among the people. They see this and they like it. They say, okay, here's finally somebody who's trying to do something. I mean, is it totally surprised that the current political mood around the world favors strong men who promise to deliver all kinds of dramatic changes and break up vested interests and you know, fix the things? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to say, I was struck by the uh, cartoon about the Chinese building a wall <laughs> and, you know, the U.S. wanting it to go down the way. Oh, well, that, that could come back to bite us. So, uh, please join me once again. I thought it was a really interesting discussion. Thank you, Thank you guys. And once again, for the students left, please come up.